Mark chapter 6, please. Mark chapter 6, and we'll read verses 45 through 56. Verses 45 through 56. This passage talks about the Lord Jesus Christ after his feeding of the 5,000. You talk about a great revival meeting that they had. 5,000 plus people being fed to the full. But it was after this revival meeting of feeding the 5,000, he had to send his disciples out in a storm to row the boat in their ship while Jesus Christ was isolated and alone. But it was during that storm that we know the story that he provided another miraculous working again. Not just the feeding of the 5,000, but he walked upon the water. He got them safely to shore. Peter was able to walk partially some part of the way on the water because of that. And then he returned back to another location, and these people were hungry once more for a mighty working from Jesus Christ. When God shows up, my friend, there's a lot of miracles involved, a lot of mighty things involved. The Bible says in verse 45, And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when he even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, this I be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. And when they had passed over, they came into the land of Gennesaret and drew to the shore. And when they were come out of the ship, straightway they knew him. And ran through that whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick where they heard he was. And whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch it were but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. There are three separate accounts and stories that we're going to cover and then one is after his feeding of the 5,000 where he was isolated and the disciples were isolated in the storm. Secondly is the miracle, the mighty working involved of Jesus Christ where he was walking on the water and calmed the storm. And the third thing is the mighty working where he was able to minister to people where they were able to just touch the hem of his garment and were made whole. In these three accounts, what you're going to notice is a mighty working of God involved whenever he shows up. Whenever God shows up, you can bet that there's a mighty working involved. We all love that. What we don't like is the isolation part. What we don't like is going out in our ships, rowing and toiling. What we don't like is to go through the storms ourselves. In the mighty workings of God, I want to challenge and inspire this church to maintain the mighty, miraculous work of Jesus Christ, no matter what storm that they go through in their lives. When God shows up, it's a mighty work, and it does not have to end after a revival meeting. There was no doubt God showed up last week. There was no doubt we saw Jesus feeding of the 5,000, so to speak. The miraculous working of his, where he was able to minister to so many people. We were able to have a taste of that. We were able to sing and shout and enjoy a good time and then just feast. Just feast on what Jesus Christ has given to us. But it does not have to end there. It's important that we have to maintain that miraculous working. Maintain that revival spirit. And we can. When God shows up, he does not have to leave us. We can maintain him. We can maintain that awesome presence. As we all know doctrinally, God cannot leave us. His presence cannot leave us. He is eternally secured. So there's something wrong in our part on why he does not manifest his presence to us. 
I don't mean visibly, but you can see certain fruits of the Spirit that are manifested out of the spiritual presence. So why is it that God does not manifest His fruits upon our life? I hope that this sermon could speak to you and that God can constantly show up in your life and that every day could be a blowout and not just last week. The title of my message is When God Shows Up. Let's pray. Father God, we have a tendency to go back to our usual routine and forget that you showed up. I pray that our usual routine will not rob us of enjoying your presence, of enjoying a revival spirit. I pray it will be maintained that you'll fill within me Holy Spirit unction and power and the cleansing of your blood so that I can be a fit vessel to preach for you, not because I'm fit or worthy, but because you deserve all the worthiness and the glory and the praise, and you're using this tool to preach your message. Will you please do so? Speak to these people's hearts. Speak to our church, Lord. Help us maintain your mighty working and that revival, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My first point is the person must return. The person must return. When we look at verse 45, the Bible says, And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. I mean, Jesus Christ, he straightway, the verse said he straightway sent his disciples back to the ship. And that ship was headed out toward a storm. Don't you think Jesus Christ knew that? Jesus Christ, after his feeding of the 5,000, and you can imagine all those people just enjoying uh, the loaves and the fishes and Jesus Christ is preaching. I mean, can you imagine? Maybe there were, you just don't know, maybe there were some people who shouted amen and ran across the aisles. You just don't know. I mean, you got a 5,000 meeting right there. A great blowout, a great revival service. And right here in the middle of fellowship, them basking in the enjoyment and that revival, Jesus says, okay, get out of here. Go to your ship. Go back to work. Go back to your life. Go back to that storm. And then in your heart, you're like, why? I mean, wouldn't God want to maintain this revival spirit? Wouldn't the Lord obviously want to keep this? Of course he would. Of course he would. But we, that doesn't mean that we neglect our usual routines, our usual duties. And we feel like that after a summer camp, after a blowout, or after any kind of revival meeting, it's as if straightway the button switched off. Back to our usual routine. So sudden. And you hate that. You and I hate that. But you know, in this verse, I don't think that the disciples, they just switched off like that. I don't think that the disciples, after they were straightway sent out to the middle of the storm, rowing and toiling in their ship, that they were just left like that. I don't think Jesus did it that way. God don't leave you like that, my friend. God don't dare leave you like that. You know, what those disciples, I think that they carried something. They didn't go in empty-handed. They didn't return empty-handed. When they returned to their usual routine, they returned with something. Notice right here when we look at verse 41, by context, 41. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and break the loaves and gave them. Okay, that specific breads and fishes, right? The one that brought that revival meeting. When God showed up, man, the gave them to who? His disciples to set before them. Okay, so the disciples, they hold the bread and the fish, right? They were the ones that held it. They were the ones that held that particular thing that contributed to their revival meeting, to that miraculous working. They held it in their hands. They were passing it out to people, but they were not done. Look at verse 43. And they took up, okay, then that's in context of the disciples, right? Remember, they were handing out the fish and bread, correct? So they have to do this part too at verse 43. They took up what? Twelve baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. If they were passing them out, they have to collect the leftovers too. So notice 
right after their mighty revival meeting that Jesus said, okay, we're not going to end it here. All right, this is, the food's not over. I want you to collect the leftovers, the fragments from this revival meeting. And what do you think they did with that? Throw, throw it away? What do you think they did? They would take it with them. They take it with them. You know what I think? Those disciples, when after they were collecting those leftovers, the Bible says the context is them. I mean, what are they going to do with those fragments? They're going to have to take it back to their ship. So when Jesus Christ straightway sent them back to the storm of their life, to their ship, they didn't go back empty-handed. They took, <laughs> praise the Lord, they took 12 baskets full of fragments. You know, my friend, uh, when you return from a mighty meeting with God, after God shows up, it doesn't have to end there. You can take the leftovers after it. Oh, wow. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ, it ain't over. I know straightway you go back to the storm. Straightway you're back to your ship rowing and toiling. Straightway you're going back to your usual routine. But my friend, you ain't going back empty-handed. Praise the Lord that you've taken 12 baskets full. Woo! Oh, the Bible believers blow out. You're not going to go back empty-handed. From the big meeting, you got leftovers. You got leftovers, and you can take them home with you. I'll, give, I'll tell you one thing. You can take that fire with you. The meeting did something to you. The, when the Lord showed up, it stirred up a fire in your heart. The fire does not have to close when God sends you back outside to the storm. You can protect that fire. Make sure that storm doesn't have its wind and rain. Blow it out. You can protect that fire. Keep it burning. Keep it burning. That passion that you receive from the singing, that passion that you receive from the preaching, that passion you receive from the fellowship, if it stirred up something in your heart and your emotions, bless God, you can take it back home with you. So it's not gone. It's not over. You can take that leftover. And what the blood I gave to you to take back home with you is that fire. Yeah. That fire don't die. You know, it also took back. Uh, it also gave you commitment. Yeah. It gave you commitment. Commitment is not done only in a revival meeting. It's not only at a time when Jesus feeds 5,000 right there. It's not at that particular meeting. Commitment is more so not during the meeting, but after the meeting. The blowout service, what it gifted to you is here's a commitment now. Here's something from the preaching of the word of God that you surrender to the Lord. That you said, God, I surrender this sin. Lord, I commit myself to do this action for you. When I get back home, I'm going to set some things in my life to change. I change my thoughts. I change my previous thinking and my previous feelings that were in the wrong place and you set me in right order. Now that preaching of the word of God gave you a commitment. So now you can take that commitment back home with you. Right, right. Praise the Lord that the revival meeting gave you a fragment, 12 baskets full, and that's called commitment. Yeah. Now you can take commitment back home and then set your house in order, clean up your life. Live your life for Jesus Christ. How are you doing? How well are you using your 12 baskets? Are you, are you using them? Are you enjoying them? Or those 12 baskets full of leftovers, you just throw them in the garbage. You just threw them in the garbage. You just let it rot outside. You know, a fragment that you can take back home with you after the revival meeting is just the memories of that experience. You know, you've got memories now. That's one thing why I can't go back to the world. It's because I have too many memories of what I experienced. I mean, God's been too good to me. I've been to too many revival meetings. I've been to too many sermons. I fellowship with too many Bible believers. I've just been ruined. I've experienced so much and received a passion and a fire and a thrill and saw the mighty working of God that now they are edged in my mind and I cannot forget them. And that's what I take home with me now. Praise the Lord. After the revival meeting, it gave me a fragment of memories. Memories. Wonderful memories. How can I enjoy my life in sin remembering about that time when I gave a shout to the Lord? How can I go back to my mundane lifestyle and think work is worth it 
when I remember that time when I was so happy to give to that missionary my money instead, to work in the church, to get involved and help out brethren, to see souls get saved. How can I go back to that mundane lifestyle? I'm ruined. Now I remember. Now I got memories. That's one thing that the revival meeting can give you a leftover is those fragments of those memories, precious memories. How can one go back to their old lifestyle after that? You know, a fragment that you can also enjoy is that the revival meeting can be recorded. It can be marked down. That's why there are notes there. When you hear such really good preaching and you write it down, five years later, you may not uh, keep that in your mind, but when you open up that book, then when you look at that note, it recalls. You recall the revival meeting. You recall when God showed up. That's what those notes do to you. Now we're in the tech age. We got it on video. We got it on audio. I mean, the revival meeting is not over. I mean, you can always go back. You can just play the video. You can listen to the audio. I remember that time when I was all alone after my blowout meetings back at PBI. And then going back to Wicked, California is so discouraging. It's so draining. But then I bought those MP3s of the blowout and I turn them on in maximum volume and just hear those people singing, hear the preaching of the Word of God and hear Dr. Vince Massa preaching at that blowout about heaven and I just get all pumped up and shout, Woo! Glory! Amen. See, that is my leftover from the revival. Yes. Yes. I can take that home with me. Now, uh, the Lord has blessed us with an incredible presence online. You can watch it anytime you want. You can see it anytime you want. It's incredible the fragments, the leftover, what God gives is because of the recordings that I have. It could be a note, it could be a video, it could be an audio. But I take those fragments home with me. You know, one of the most important things, the most important leftover, the fragments that Jesus told me to carry from the revival meeting is, is any of those nuggets that he showed me in that meeting that opened my eyes that I realized, wow, this can help me in my life. And those precious nuggets, those lessons that I saw that I could only see at a revival meeting that I don't see in my everyday mundane life, but those nuggets that I saw, now those things can help me and I can carry them with me for the rest of my life. Not, I'm not just talking about commitment. I'm talking about nuggets that opened my eyes that made me see something that I never saw before and I'm like, I can now take that home with me and put that to use in my practical living. That's the blessing of a revival meeting, is that I can take those fragments with me. You know, when God shows up, it doesn't have to end there. You can take some of those leftovers, those fragments from him. My second point is the person must remove. The person must remove. Look at verse 46 through 47. <clears throat> the Bible says, And when he had sent them away... He departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. Jesus removed the disciples from the 5,000 plus revival meeting. Jesus removed himself from fellowship and was isolated all alone. You talk about removals. When we remove ourselves from fellowship and a big meeting and now we're left all alone, it just feels like God don't show up now. God only shows up when there's a big number, huh? God only shows up in a revival meeting, huh? God only shows up when we're enjoying such mass fellowship together. That's what you would think. When you're all alone, when you remove yourself from all this revival, this spiritual presence, this mighty working of God. Hard to believe that God will show up. Sure don't feel like it. But I would beg to differ. Just because you're alone doesn't mean God don't show up anymore. You want me to show you something? Uh, look at verse 46. Where was Jesus? All right. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. Now, notice right here that Jesus Christ, he wasn't thinking like, Oh, woe is me. I removed myself from everything. I mean, I had such a mountaintop experience with God. Now that's all over. No, the Bible says that God still showed up because he prayed. 
The Bible says he still had a mountaintop experience. Yes. The Bible says he went into a mountain to pray. You know, my friend, what it points out right here is that your mountaintop experience does not have to end when the blowout ends. Even when you're alone with God, you can maintain that mountaintop experience with God. God still shows up even when you're alone. You can pray to him. You have a one-on-one -on -one time with him. Notice that God still showed up with Jesus Christ when he was all alone on the top of a mountain. He maintained his mountaintop experience. He didn't lose it after that feeding of the 5,000. You can keep yourself up there. You know that? See? Just because you removed yourself from people, from the fellowship, from the blowout, that don't mean you removed yourself from the mountaintop. You can still have that, all right? Just keep yourself up there. That's it. I mean, what you got, this mountaintop experience, doesn't have to end at the blowout. Who says shouting is only reserved for a blowout? Who says that running is only reserved for the blowout? Who says that fellowship is only reserved for the blowout? Who says that winning souls is only reserved for the blowout? Who says that repenting of your sin is only reserved for the blowout? Who says that serving God is only reserved for the blowout? Who says that love, joy, peace is only reserved for the blowout? Bless God, you can maintain that. Keep your mountaintop experience with God. Keep yourself high up there, man. Keep yourself high. Are you high on God? Keep it up there, man. Get yourself lost in that. But, you know, that flesh, it always feels like faltering downhill, don't it? Always wants to come off the mountain, that flesh. Always that flesh feels like it just wants to falter downhill back to a valley. Go down low. Just get off the mountain. I mean, it's hard to maintain yourself up in that mountaintop when that flesh kicks in, when life kicks in, when hardship kicks in, and then everything just makes your flesh feel miserable, and it's just forcing your flesh, dragging it downhill. But you need to do what Jesus did. You know how he kept himself up there on the mountain? There was one thing what kept him up there on the mountain. You'll notice right here that when we return to our verse... In verse 46 again, he departed into a mountain. Why was he able to stay in that mountain? In the mountain. To what? Pray. That's the only thing that kept him up there. That it's because of prayer. That's what, that's the only thing that kept him up there. If there was no prayer, he can't stay up there. He's got to go back downhill. You know what's the only thing that can keep you up there? Sometimes it's just nothing. It's not the bass drum. It's not the excellent song leader. It's not your song books. And it's not the massive brethren around you. Sometimes all it takes is nothing but prayer with God. And that's all you can do to keep yourself high on the mountain. When you lose that joy. When you lose that peace. When you lose that fire. And your flesh feels like falling off the mountain. And going back down to the valley. All you can do is fall on your knees and say, God, oh, help me maintain my joy in you. God, help me keep my mind on Jesus Christ and not on the sorrow, not on the trial, not on the hardship, not how my flesh feels. God, save me. Keep me up there with you. You know how you keep yourself on that mountain is that you got to pray. You got to keep praying to the Lord. And then God, he gives you that grace, right? He gives you that grace to go through that trial and then like Paul, when he receives that grace, he's able to still rejoice. He says after he got that thorn in the flesh, Paul said that he received grace from God, and he said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmity. See, Paul never lost his glory, even after the thorn in the flesh, because of that prayer, because of God sustaining him with his grace. And that's what you need, my friend. You need the grace of God, which is done by prayer. And you need to come before the throne of grace, fall on your knees, pray to God and say, God, keep me up here with you. God don't have to only show up in a revival meeting. Okay. You can have it as soon as this service is over. Yes. You can have it right now. Yes. You can have it the rest of your life. Keep yourself up there. Just keep yourself up there. And whenever your flesh feels like dragging down, just come before the throne in prayer and say, God, help me. Keep me up here. Yes. You know, Philippians chapter 1, verse 4 and 25, Paul even said, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy. 
And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. See, Paul, he realized that the Philippians, they had the joy of the Lord. They maintained that uh, power, that positive spirit, that revival, that fire. And so Paul says that that's why I keep praying for you, to stay up there, to never lose that joy in the Lord. My third point is the person must reach out. The person must reach out. Look at verse 48 through 49. 48 through 49. <clears throat> the Bible says, and he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out. You know, notice right here that God showed up again. Uh, not just the feeding of the 5,000. Oh, God showed up in that meeting. 5,000 fed. Woo! Glory to God. No, it doesn't even have to be there. God showed up again in the storm. God showed up again while they were rowing and toiling in their ship. Jesus Christ showed up again. I mean, what revival meeting? What glory mode can you get better than that than walking on the water, man? <laughs> Man, you talk about, woo, man. You talk about a glory moment walking on the water. Not only that, Jesus Christ calmed them from their storms in life. When God calms the storms in your life, don't you feel like you just got a revival meeting? Don't you feel like you got a glory moment? Not only that, Peter got to walk on the water with Jesus. I mean, albeit just maybe a third of the way or halfway, I don't know, but at least he got to walk a couple steps. That was really cool, man. I mean, you thought the blowout meaning you just walk on water, man. I mean, you can do it in, even in, during the storms of life, bless God. Just feel like walking on water with Jesus. What a glory mode. God showed up again. What a blessing. Doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be only the feeding of the 5,000. Doesn't have to end there. God can show up again. God can bring another revival meeting again. You can have another glory moment with God. But didn't you know the disciples could have missed out all of that? Didn't you know this passage showed you that the disciples could have missed out all of that, where Jesus Christ could have calmed the storms of life for them, where Peter could have got his chance to walk on the water with Jesus, where they got to see Jesus walking on the water. They could have missed all that? You might say they could have, yes, because the Bible points out right here at verse 48 through 49. Notice, read 48 again. And he saw them toiling and rowing. Okay, so here they are. They're so focused in their toiling in their usual routine in their ship. All right, they're so caught up in toiling. For the wind was contrary unto them. So now they're caught up with the storms in their life. All right, all their focus and attention is on that. Keep reading, and about the fourth watch of the night. Okay, so it's dark too. So you can miss it out easily because you can't really see. He cometh unto them walking upon the sea and what? Would have passed by them. What is the author indicating here? He's indicating that Jesus would have just passed by them. They could have missed out. If the disciples were so caught up in their toiling, in their rowing, and then use the excuse, it's too dark in the night, it's the fourth watch of the night. The wind is so strong, you know, I was just so caught up in that. If they use that as their excuse, they would have missed out seeing Jesus walking on the water. They would have totally missed out. They would have missed another glory moment with the Lord. Jesus Christ how he was able to be caught by the disciples, how the disciples were able to maintain their glory moment, get another glory moment, excuse me, is because the disciples responded. They reached out to him. They cried out. They saw him and they said, oh, it's a spirit. And they were crying out, the Bible says, the next verse. Peter reached out. He said, Lord, let me come to you and walk on the water. If you compare that with Matthew chapter 14, it's the same story. Notice that because these disciples reached out to Jesus, that's why they were able to have another glory moment. See, Peter wouldn't have walked on the water if he didn't reach out. 
if he didn't say, God, let me walk to you on the water. Because the disciples reached out, they were able to get their other, another revival meeting, another miraculous working of Jesus. They were able to witness that. But if they didn't reach out, they would have missed out the miraculous working. You know, there's a difference with this one compared to the feeding of the 5,000. The difference with these two miracles where God showed up is that in the first one, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus handed them, handed them. He reached out. He gave the five loaves and two fishes and did the miracle. He reached out to his disciples. In the second one, he didn't. He deliberately knew, but wanted to see if they would reach out to him. So in the second miraculous working, they had to reach out to him. You know, God, he can show up again in your life. You know that? We can get another revival meeting. Some of you don't know that. You can get another blowout meeting. I mean, you don't have to wait for another year. God can give you another glory moment in your life. But the thing is this, is that he's not going to hand it out to you all the time, friend. You thought it's like the feeding of the 5,000. Oh, it was handed out to me. There were people in the church who did it for me. There were others who did it for me. God did it for me. God worked out my schedule. And then, no, 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 no. You got to realize God's not going to hand it out to you. Just like the first revival meeting. If you want that second revival meeting, you want another glory moment, don't wait for Jesus to give you the uh, food. This time you need to reach out to him. You need to be like Peter. And you don't have to have a perfect record of faith in walking on the water. It's okay you can sink, but at least have some faith like Peter. Yeah. To walk at least half of the way and get half of the revival or something. Yes. You want another glory moment with God? You need to reach out to him. But you're not reaching out. And because of that, here's Jesus walking on the water with his, all right, I got another glory moment. I can show up again in your life. But then here you are. What are you doing? Yeah. <sighs> the Bible says toiling, right? What does that mean? So busy. Preoccupied. The disciples were toiling. But they didn't let that be their excuse to miss out and reach out to Jesus. But you would. You would. You're caught up in toiling. That means preoccupied, so busy with something. that here's Jesus Christ walking on the water. Hey, another glory moment with me. Another miracle with me. You want it? But no, nope, Lord, I'm too busy. Lord, I don't see that. Million excuses come out in, your, in our minds. Well, Lord, if you would plainly show it to me, then if the world wasn't so wicked... If it was, my flesh wasn't so wicked, I would have caught that glory moment. I would have caught that revival meeting. No, no, don't use the fourth watch of the night. That spiritual darkness has your excuse too. You need to look through carefully and say, man, I, I want another moment with you, Jesus. Don't use your storms as your excuse. It's just too hard, Pastor. Life is so painful. The wind is contrary unto me, as that verse says, right? Everything's contrary to me, preventing me from coming to the revival meeting. Coming to enjoy another glory moment with God. Coming to church today at Sunday. But then we use those winds contrary in our lives to miss out another glory moment with Jesus. But not those disciples. The wind was contrary to them. But they said, Jesus. Peter said, Jesus, Lord, let me walk on the water with you. I want to run the bases with you again. I want to ski and slide on that water with you. Are you reaching out? How many times have you missed out? Because you didn't reach out. You're only looking for the miracle of Jesus feeding 5,000 because he's handing it out to you. That's all you're looking for. You're not looking for the miracle to walk on the water with him. If you want that other miracle to walk on the water, you need to reach out. You need to reach it out. My fourth point is the person must recall. The person must recall. Look at verse 50 through 52. 50 through 52. 
For they all saw him, and were troubled, and immediately he talked with them, and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. Now, this is, <laughs> what a weird reaction, all right? And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wonder. Why would you? You've seen Jesus feed the 5,000. You forgot that one? Why would you be shocked? You know, why would you go, wow, how did this happen? Hey, dummy, hey, fool, you saw the previous revival meeting, how he fed the 5,000. Uh, no, they didn't. Verse 52, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. They didn't. <laughs> they didn't consider. They forgot. They didn't recall that time when Jesus Christ, when God showed up, man. They forgot when God showed up, man. You saw how he took those little five loaves and those two little fishes, and he just sit fed 5,000 plus. Man, what a revival meeting. They forgot all of that. They didn't recall that. Because they did not recall that, that's why when Jesus Christ does this other revival now, this other miracle, they're like just so shocked, and they're like, I don't get it. How can people react like that? I mean, if it was you and me, we wouldn't. We would know. We would know that, hey, this is not a surprise. God can show up again. God can do another miracle again. When he walked on the water, when he calmed the storm, that's not a surprise to me. I already know that. God can show up again, man. He doesn't have to do... It's not just limited to the feeding of the 5,000. I remember back then the feeding of the 5,000. When God showed up, when God did the miracle, I remember that. So it's not a surprise to me. He can do it again. Now God can show up again. I believe it, man. But the problem is, is that uh, you would act like those disciples. You would not consider the feeding of the 5,000. You would not recall it. Their heart is very hard. It does not recall that revival meeting of the feeding of the 5,000. Did you really recall that feeding of the 5,000, man? Did you recall that when the preacher got up and then... Man, it felt like the Holy Spirit was dealing with you and you never heard preaching like that before in all your life. And you're like, man, what a moment. You remember, you recall that time in the feeding of the 5,000 when you went down with so many people on the altar? And you're like, man, I, this is surreal. This is something else. I'm able to surrender my life. I, I've never been to a meeting like this surrounded by people who are so supportive, who love Jesus Christ, who are Bible believers like me. You recall that time during testimonies where how God changed their lives, got them saved, got them to Bible-believing truth, and then you're like, man, wow, what a, what a time. Yes. Man, I am so thankful to be a Bible believer. What are the odds? What are the chances for me to end up being here? Uh, do you recall that it was worth it? I mean, you took time off of your busy schedule. You made sure that your health will be intact for that day. You made sure nothing in your schedule or in your family would interfere. You didn't care how much traffic there was. You're like driving through that and you say, I'm, I can't wait to get to that meeting. Do you recall all those sweat and labor that we did to painfully set up the room? Painfully set up the tech, painfully set up the platform, clean the place and then clean the air ducts and then just set up and do uh, just painful stuff, hours and hours. But man, you recall that it was really worth it because of that feeding of the 5,000 that you never see every day, man? Yeah, man? We saw how God split those two little fishies and those five loaves and just fed a 5,000 plus, man. Hey. Man, worth it. But you forgot it. You don't recall it. And that's why your heart is hard. Okay. And when Jesus offers you Hey, let's get another revival yeah. meeting. Let's, let me show up again. And I mean today. I mean right now as Pastor Gene Kim's preaching. I mean I can show up right now, bless God. Why don't you let me? But the heart is hard because you forgot. Right. Wow. You forgot God showing up last week at the blowout meeting. Your heart is hard. And you're thinking like, 
No, I can't get a revival meeting today. Friend, you got to realize this. Every effort that we pulled, that we worked so hard to do, is to create that kind of revival spirit, not just a normal church service. Can I repeat that again? Today, this Sunday, all right, today is not a day of a normal church service. It should be a revival meeting. It should be a revival service. Amen. So that's why we sing hymns. That's why we have an orchestra. That's why we have a song leader. That's why we sing these hymn books. That's why I work hard on the preaching to make sure you get really good preaching. That's why I work hard on the teaching. That's why I'll even use a stupid electronic whiteboard. I want to give you good teaching. I want to feed you. That's why we have lunch fellowship. That way we can maintain that spirit of fellowship. You know what? You can have a revival meeting right now. You can get it today. You can get it every day. But your heart is hard. Because you forgot last week. You forgot last week how the Holy Spirit moved your heart. How the Holy Spirit convicted you. How the Holy Spirit opened your eyes on some things. You forgot all that. If you remembered, if you recall all that, you'd want that again today. You want that. I mean now. I mean today. You'd want that. We can create a revival meeting right now. But then it's that spirit of yours that just heavy, flesh toiling, right? Yes, yes, there it is. And it won't create that revival meaning. Let me tell you, it's every worth of sacrifice to get here. It's, every, oh, it's, it's worth it to put in the stress, the labor, the extra effort and sacrifice so that I can taste the revival meeting again. And I even mean today. It takes every sweat and effort to give you this preaching. It is worth it to give you really, really good preaching and not just during a blowout. You want that revival spirit. You want God to show up again. You can make one now. So how's your fellowship with others? How's your involvement in the church? How's your activity and participation? How's your spirit in the singing, in the fellowship, in the response to the preaching. How is that? Let me tell you, it's worth the sacrifice. It's worth pushing an extra effort. Because I don't want just a once a year thing. I want every single time we meet and serve God. And I don't care if I have three people or one, I'm gonna still have a shouting good time. Brother Sean knows, man. No piano, no nothing. We just take out those little white hymn books and then we sing for 30 minutes straight singing hymns. I remember one time, side note, I remember one time when I was uh, pastoring this church in Palm Springs and I was with this brother. Car broke down. Sunday, couldn't have church service. I told him, bless God, I ain't losing my revival meeting. So I gave, so I gave a little Bible teaching. We took out the white hymn book and we were singing all hail Emmanuel inside a broken vehicle in the car outside a hundred degree weather and we were screaming and shouting bless God. Amen. I can't lose that revival spirit. My fifth point, the person must request. The person must request. Verses 53 through 55. 53 through 55. And when they had passed over, they came into the land of Gennesaret and drew to the shore. And when they were come out of the ship, straightway they knew him, and ran through that whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick where they heard he was. Now, didn't you know Jesus went to a place where people did not have serious issues, serious needs, or serious requests? Now, you might say, no, pastor, you're contradicting yourself. Said right here that these people were sick. They were in need. They had serious requests. What are you talking about that Jesus Christ did not go to a place where they had serious requests? No, uh, notice in the verse at verse 53. They came into the land of where? Gennesaret. He went to that place, Gennesaret. You know what Gennesaret means? A garden of riches. That's what it means. Isn't it funny that these people, even though they were in a place of no serious requests, no serious needs, no serious issues, they realized, no, I have a serious issue. I have a serious request. 
They didn't care about the place they were in. They were like, I'm going to go to Jesus Christ and bless God. I want Jesus to show up again. I want God to show up again. I want another mighty meeting with God again. They weren't thinking, no, 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 I don't need that. I'm in a place where it's all taken care of. You know why they were able to have another mighty meeting with Jesus? When Jesus shows up, man, healing all over, even just by the touch of it. Amazing. So many people swarmed him, and then he just healed them all. Another mighty working of God. Another revival meeting. God showed up again. Jesus showed up again. But those people could only have that when they didn't look at the place they were in. And they instead looked at their serious issues, serious requests. Amen. You know why you don't want a revival meeting? If you want a big revival meeting, here's how you get it. You ready? You need to realize you have a serious need for it. People who will come to the blowout will only come if they're desperate for it. If they feel like they really need it. But you know why some of those people don't come? They feel like they don't really need it. They can get by through the day. Because their spiritual walk with Jesus Christ is already good enough, you know. Because they have it made. They're taken care of already. I mean, there's no storms in their life. I mean, God's providing their needs. They got the finances. House is okay. Family's okay. My walk with Jesus Christ is okay. And then, you know, because you're all okay, that's why you're not that desperate for it. And why some people might not want to come to a Sunday meeting service. They're not that desperate for it. They don't think that they really need it. If you want God to show up again, my friend, you need to realize I have a serious, serious need for it. Then God will give you a big revival meeting. That's why we don't get it. We don't have enough needy people. Praise the Lord. We got people driving hours to get to a big meeting. Thousands of miles. But you know what? We don't have enough. We don't have enough. If we come to the size of our church, I wonder if there's any. Okay. If there's any. Well. Revelation 3.17 says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need, and have need, I got a need, of nothing. Of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind and naked. You know what this verse is for? Us. That's a spiritual application to us, the church of Laodicea. Is this verse talking about you? Did I read about you? Did I just read your heart right now? In Revelation 3.17. Verse 56. 56. The last point is the person must receive. The person must receive. And whithersoever he entered, into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, if it were but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. You know, in this passage, it's indicating something. Notice right here, they besought him. That means they're, they're desperate, they're begging. They got a serious request. That they might. See, that's like possibly. And I have at least this chance, this possible chance of touching just the tip of his garment. It shows the desperation right here. Now, why is there such a desperate request like that? A desperate need for that? Unless those sick people realize Jesus wouldn't heal all of them. Maybe they were that desperate, they requested so hard, and they said, let me just at least touch the tip of your garment. Maybe the reason why they said all that, they were that desperate, is because they knew Jesus would not have the time to put his hands on all of them and heal them. Is that really true? Well, look at Luke chapter 5. Keep your hand here, Luke chapter 5. It is actually true. Didn't you know that Jesus Christ was so busy in the ministry 
he did not want people to throng him so that he spends all his time healing them. He was so busy in the ministry. He was just one man. He couldn't take care of all of them. Luke chapter 5, verse 12 through 16. The Bible says in verse 12, And it came to pass, when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. And he charged him to tell no man. He didn't want him to tell anybody about the healing. But the leper didn't. And at verse 15, But so much the more went there a fame abroad of him, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness. See that? He wanted to separate from all that. Why? He didn't have that time to heal everybody. He was just too popular. So think about this. If Jesus had that kind of a history, don't get me wrong, there were times. He made time. He made time for people. He had compassion. He preached. But the disciples, why would they try to drive away the people from him? You ever thought about why? Because they knew how busy he was. How he didn't have time for all that. Even when little children came, the disciples forbade. Because they were just looking out for their pastor. He's too busy. You got to give him a break. But Jesus Christ was so compassionate. He said, no, 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 no. Let them come to me. My point is this. This is evidence how busy Jesus was. He couldn't make time for everybody. And the people knew that. The disciples knew that. Those sick people at Mark 6 knew that. Look, there's like thousands of people, and here am I in the back of the line right here, and Jesus is all the way there. He could pass by me. I might not get a chance. So that person who's got a serious request or a need is pleading. Please, please, at least let me just touch. I mean, let me just, you can just pass by me. You don't have to put your hand on me. You don't have to heal me. You don't have to make time for me. Just pass by me and let me touch the border of your garment. At least, I'm desperate for that much. These people were willing to do anything to get out of that sickness, even if it's something small from Jesus. They weren't looking, see, for a big 5,000 feeding. See that? They weren't looking for something big like walking on the water. They weren't looking for anything big. Just to get out of the sickness, they're willing to do anything, just even a small thing. Let me touch the border of your garment. You know, uh, the current state you're in, if we're going to be totally honest, don't you feel sick? I don't know about you, I feel sick. I mean, the life that I'm living, the world that I'm in, everything that I'm bound to duty-wise and problems going on in my personal life, in my family life and people around me, work life and etc. I mean, this is a sick world we live in. Let's be honest, you and I are sick people. Our current condition is we're very sick. But we're not desperate, see? We're not desperate for even the smallest thing from God to touch. You know that? Just the smallest thing. I'm not talking about walking on the water, guys. I'm not talking about feeding 5,000. I'm not talking about Bible believers blow out. I'm not talking about having nine good preachers lined up. I'm not talking about having a room full of people. I'm not talking about singing hymns for hours. I'm not talking about souls getting saved. I'm, not, I'm talking about just a small meeting. Very few people. Just a few songs. Just one sermon to get me through. You're not desperate for that. You're content to stay sick. The sick workplace, the sick family life, the sick lifestyle. You're, the past week, I bet you has been sick to some of you. 
but you're content to stay that way rather than get even a small portion of his garment. Just one song, pastor. Just one sermon, please. Just one more minute to fellowship with my brother and sister. Just one more thing to get involved in the church work. I want that so badly. If you realized how serious your request, your need is, your sickness is, you will do anything to get out of it. If you hate a cold, I know this, you will do anything to get out of it, even if it's just a small little pill. Just even one drink of that syrup. And you know it's not going to do you a lick of good, but you do it anyway. You know why? You're desperate to get out of your sickness. That you don't care how small it is, it's better than the current state I'm in. But some of you don't want that. You know, I'll be honest with you, just one-tenth of what I tasted last week at the revival meeting, just a tenth of that is far better than what I'm going through right now. I want it that much. Are you hate? Are, do you hate being sick? Don't you want just, just even a thread piece of that garment? I don't know about you, but I just want a, a touch of God. Just a touch of God. Jesus don't have to put both of his hands on me. I just want a little touch of him. Just a touch of his spirit. Just a touch of his feeling. Just a touch of his presence. Just a touch of his love. Just a touch of him meeting me in my life. I want it that much. I want it that bad. I hate being sick. I'll do anything for it. God, God, please just look. I don't care how far I have to drive. I don't care how much hour, extra hours I have to put. I don't care how much sweat and labor I have to do for it. God, I don't care. Just, just you can just pass by me. You don't have to give me feeding of 5,000. I don't have to walk on the water. Please, God, just give me, just give me a piece. Just let me touch the hem of your garment. That's all I want, God. How much do you want the touch, just even a touch of God? Next Sunday could be five people for all I care, but I just want a touch. Yeah. Even if it's just five people, I just want a touch of yeah. God. Yeah. I don't have to get a room full of people. And you know what? God can still show up. Yeah. Right. Every eye bow and every eye shut. How much do you want it?